Welcome back to another episode of Rock and Rob's Metal Madness Podcast. I am your host with the most, the major rager, the metal maniac, the Apache Norseman from hell himself, Rock and Rob. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, especially our first time listeners. If you're tuning in from YouTube, please like, share and sub- this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you want to support me directly, please send me a digital tip through formats like Cash App, Chime, PayPal, or Venmo to Rock and Rob SA210. That's R O C K I N R O B S A210. You can also support me through Patreon. The link is in my YouTube channel description. You can also search Patreon for an Apache Norseman from Hell. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, or would just like to chat, feel free to send me an email to rockandroblives210, that's R-O-C-K-I-N-R-O-B-L-I-V-E-S-210, at gmail.com. On today's episode, the top 13 rated heavy metal albums of all time. On today's episode, I'm going to discuss the top 13 albums rated by loudwire.com in the heavy metal genre. Now, I need to point out that the list was originally 50 albums, But I decided to cut it down to the top 13. Why? I just like the number 13. Also, I'm going to include some descriptions from the albums on this list from Wikipedia, as well as my own commentary on this matter. This is not my personal list, rather a list of what are considered some of the highest rated metal albums according to Loutwire.com and Metal Music Critics. I'll go through the list starting at number 13 all the way to number 1. Let's do this shit, shall we? Number 13, System of a Down, Toxicity. Toxicity is the second studio album by American heavy metal band System of a Down, released on September 4th, 2001, through American Recordings and Columbia Records. Expanding on their 1998 eponymous debut album, Toxicity incorporates more melody, harmonies, and singing than the band's first album. Categorized primarily as alternative metal or new metal, the album features elements from multiple genres, including folk, progressive rock, jazz, and Armenian and Greek music, including prominent use of instruments like the sitar, banjo, keyboards, and piano. It contains a wide array of political and non-political themes, such as mass incarceration, the CIA, the environment, police brutality, drug addiction, scientific reductionism, and groupies. Toxicity was recorded at Cello Studios in Hollywood, California. Over 30 songs were recorded, but the band narrowed the number of the songs on the album to 14. The album peaked at number one on both the Billboard 200 and Canadian albums charts, selling 2,200... Sorry... 2,200 copies on its first week of its release. It was certified six times platinum by the Recording Industry Association of America, the RAAA, in July 2022, signifying at least 6 million copies sold in the United States. All of Toxicity's singles reached the Billboard Hot 100. The final single, Aerials, went number one on both mainstream rock tracks and modern rock charts. Toxicity received highly positive ratings and reviews from critics, among them perfect ratings from AllMusic, Kerrang! and Blabbermouth.net. Many critics praised the album's sound and innovation and ranked it on multiple year-end lists. The promotional shows for Toxicity resulted in a number of controversial incidents. A six-hour riot ensued at a free concert in Hollywood, the day before the album's release, as a result of the show's cancellation due to an overcrowded show, the crowd in attendance was estimated to at least be twice the size that was expected. Another scheduled System of a Down performance was canceled to prevent a similar riot. The band then toured with Slipknot and bassist, forgive my pronunciation, Osha, Shavo Odajian was harassed, racially profiled, and physically beaten by guards when he tried to enter the backstage at a concert in October 2001. I remember listening to this album shortly after its release in 2001. In the wake of the 9-11 attacks, 
the album drew a lot of attention, not only from metal fans, but radio gave it a lot of attention as well. The single Chop Suey was insanely popular when it was released and still gets constant rotation on the radio to this day. It's been used in movie soundtracks, and there are references all over the place in the popular culture. I even bought a tablature book to learn some of the songs on guitar. I especially enjoyed learning the title track off the record as well as the song Aerials. What a great album. Number 12, Motorhead, Ace of Spades. Ace of Spades is the fourth studio album by British rock band Motorhead, released in October 1980 via Bronze Records. It is the band's most commercially successful album, peaking at number four on the UK Albums Chart and reaching gold status in the UK by March 1981. It was preceded by the release of the title track as a single in October, which peaked on the UK Singles Chart at number 15 in early November. It was the band's debut release in the United States, with Mercury Records handling distribution in North America. In 2020, the album was ranked 408 on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time list. By 1979, Motorhead had released two extremely successful classic albums, Overkill and Bomber, and gained a loyal fan following by constant touring and television appearances. Their ferocious, loud, proto-thrash playing style appealed equally to punks and heavy metal fans, but in 1979, sounds writer Jeff Barton coined them term the new wave of British heavy metal. To classify a slew of newer bands such as Iron Maiden, Def Leppard, and Saxon. Motorhead, a band that resented being labeled anything other than rock and roll, was placed in this new genre which would go on to influence emerging thrash metal movement that would include bands like Metallica and Megadeth. I'm not going to lie. I enjoy some of the Motorhead songs I've heard in the past. Metallica was a big gateway for my interest in Motorhead. However, outside of the title track on this record, I haven't really listened to this album in particular. That being said, I do plan to give it a bit of a chance because I've liked what I've heard by Motorhead before, so I don't doubt there isn't going to be a lot of amazing tracks off this record. I'll give it a listen really soon. Number 11, Tool, Lateralis. Lateralis is the third studio album by American rock band Tool. It was released May 15, 2001 through Volcano Entertainment. The album was recorded at Cello Studios in Hollywood, and The Hook, Big Empty Space, and The Lodge in North Hollywood between October 2000 and January 2001. David Bottrill, who had produced two of the band's previous releases, Anima and Salival, produced the album along with the band, and became the last Tool album produced by Bottrill to date. On August 23rd, 2005, Lateralis was released as a limited edition two-picture disc vinyl LP in holographic gatefold package. The album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 chart, selling more than 555,200 copies in its first week of release. It was certified double platinum by the RIAA on August 5th, 2003. On February 13th, 2015, the album was certified gold by the BPI. It was also certified platinum in Australia and double platinum in Canada. The band won a Grammy Award for Best Metal Performance for the song Schism in 2002. Lateralis ranked 100, number 123 on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's Definitive 200 list. I remember this one specifically, and it's a real fucking banger. I remember vividly in 2002, around the time this album came out and seeing the video for the first single for the song Schism. The video, just like all music videos by Tool, was trippy as fuck. It looks like something out of artwork by H.R. Geiger, the guy who designed the creatures for the Alien franchise. Other songs I loved were songs like Parabola, 
Lateralis, the title track. Also, I believe Ticks and Leeches was on the record, but that might have been Anima. Damn good record by the band. Also a damn good record from the early 2000s. Definitely go give that one a listen. Number 10, Black Sabbath, Master of Reality. Master of Reality is the third studio album by English heavy metal band Black Sabbath, released in August 1971 by Vertigo Records. It is regarded by some critics as the foundation of doom metal, stoner rock, and sludge metal. Produced by Roger Bain, who also produced the band's two prior albums, Master of Reality was recorded at Island Studios in London from February to April of 1971. Guitarist Tony Iommi and bassist Geezer Butler downtuned their instruments during the production, achieving what Tony Iommi called a bigger, heavier sound. Master Reality peaked at number five on the UK's album's chart and number eight on the US Billboard 200. Negatively received by critics on release, the album is now considered one of the greatest heavy metal albums of all time. It was certified double platinum after having sold over 2 million copies. This is a band for sure that falls into one of my top five favorite bands of all time. I got to see them on their farewell tour in 2016 at their last U.S. tour date in San Antonio on my 35th birthday, no less. Some of the songs that were on this record were played during the show. Songs off this record that are must-listens are, well, pretty much the entire record from start to finish is nothing short of badass. One of the best ones were songs like Sweet Leaf, Children of the Grave, Lord of This World, Solitude, and Into the Void. A must-listen from the Black Sabbath discography if there ever was one. Number nine, Megadeth, Peace Sells, But Who's Buying? Peace Sells, But Who's Buying is the second studio album by American thrash metal band Megadeth, released on September 19th, 1986 through Capitol Records. The project was originally handled by Combat Records, resulting in the original mix of the album being co-produced by Randy Burns. Capitol Records then bought the rights to the album and hired another producer named Paul Lani to mix it himself. Recording of the album was difficult for the band because of the ongoing drug issues the members had at the time. Drummer Gar Samuelson and guitarist Chris Poland were fired shortly after the album's promotional tour for drug abuse, making Peace Sells Samuelson's last Megadeth album. Poland reappeared as a session musician on Megadeth's 2004 album, The System Has Failed. The title track, noted for its politically conscious lyrics, was released as the album's second single, but the band's first music video. The album's cover art featuring the band's mascot Vic Rattlehead in front of a desolated United Nations headquarters was created by Ed Repka. The video for one of the first singles off this record was my first introduction to Megadeth. Honestly, I feel like this album didn't belong on the list, I would have selected the album Rest in Peace instead. I felt that was a far superior album and a much more important one for the band. But then again, that's just me. Most of the famous songs by far were Wake Up Dead and the title track off the record. The other songs are good too, but those two tracks by far are my favorite. I would have gone with Rest in Peace, but again, just my opinion. I can't deny the importance of this record on the genre and for thrash metal in particular. Number 8, Metallica, Ride the Lightning. Ride the Lightning is the second studio album by American heavy metal band Metallica, released on July 27, 1984, by the independent record label Megaforce Records. The album was recorded in three weeks with producer Fleming Rasmussen at Sweet Silent Studios in Copenhagen, Denmark. The artwork, based on a concept by the band, depicts an electric chair being struck by lightning, flowing from the band logo. The title was taken from the passage Stephen King's novel The Stand, in which a character uses the phrase to refer to electrocution by electric chair. Excuse me, execution by electric chair. 
Learn how to read, fool. Although rooted in the thrash metal genre, the album showcased the band's musical growth and lyrical sophistication. Bassist Cliff Burton introduced the basics of music theory to the band and had put more input in the songwriting. Beyond the fast tempos of its debut Kill 'Em All, Metallica broadened its approach by employing acoustic guitars, extended instrumentals, and more complex harmonies. The overall recording costs were paid by Metallica's European label, Music for Nations, because Megaforce was unable to cover it. This is the last album to feature songwriting contributions from former lead guitarist Dave Mustaine of Megadeth, and the first to feature contributions from the successor, Kirk Hammett. Ride the Lightning received a positive response from music critics who saw it as a more ambitious effort than its predecessor. Metallica promoted the album on Bang That Head That Doesn't Bang European Tour in late 1984 and on its North American leg of its their first half of 1985. The band performed at major music festivals such as Monsters of Rock and Day on the Green later that year. Two months after its release, Elektra Records signed Metallica to a multi-year deal and reissued the album. Ride the Lean. Lightning peaked at number 100 on the Billboard 200 with virtually no radio exposure, although 75,000 copies were initially pressed for the North American market. The album sold half a million by November 1987. It was certified six times platinum by the Recording Industry Association of America, the RAAA, in 2012 for shipping six million copies in the United States. Many rock rubber Rock publications have ranked Ride the Lightning on their best album lists, saying it had a lasting impact on the genre. This was definitely a favorite of mine from 80s era Metallica. Definitely important to the genre and to the band Metallica. It was a major departure from the first record. The band was definitely growing and maturing from this record onward. A great record from start to finish. Songs like For Whom the Bell Tolls, Fade to Black, and Creeping Death are some of my all-time favorites off this record. A must-listen for any Metallica fans out there. Number 7. Judas Priest, Screaming for Vengeance. Screaming for Vengeance is the eighth studio album by English heavy metal band Judas Priest. Released in July 1982 by Columbia Records. Considered the band's commercial breakthrough, it's been certified double platinum in the United States and platinum in Canada. Screaming for Vengeance spawned the hit You've Got Another Thing Coming, which became one of the band's signature songs and the perennial radio favorite. This was another critically acclaimed record in metal music that I haven't heard enough from to form a genuine opinion about it although I don't dispute its importance in the genre. The only track I'm familiar with for sure is You've Got Another Thing Coming. Definitely going to give that one a listen soon. Number six, Blizzard, Ozzy Osbourne, Blizzard of Oz. Blizzard of Oz is the debut studio album by English heavy metal vocalist Ozzy Osbourne, released on September 20th, 1980 in the UK and on 27th of March, 1981 in the United States. The album was Osborne's first relief following his firing from Black Sabbath in 1979. Blizzard of Oz is the first of two studio albums recorded with guitarist Randy Rhodes prior to Rhodes' death in 1982. In 2017, was ranked number nine on Rolling Stone's list of 100 greatest metal albums of all time. Much of the album was written by guitarist Randy Rhodes, bassist Bob Daisley, and Ozzy Osbourne in a live-in rehearsal facility in Monmouth, Wales, with a friend of Osbourne's named Barry Screenage performing as the group's drummer. Screenage was never considered a, as a candidate to be the group's permanent drummer and was not involved in the songwriting process at all. The band recorded demos for the songs I Don't Know and Crazy Train, Goodbye to Romance, and You Looking at Me Looking at You in Birmingham in early 1980 with ex-Lone Star drummer Dixie Lee. 
They hoped Lee would be a permanent member, but he wasn't the final piece of the puzzle Dace bassist Daisley recalls. After auditioning several drummers, ex Uriah Heat drummer Lee Kerslake was hired as the permanent drummer. The completed lineup retreated to Clearwell Castle in Gloucestershire for six days to rehearse and gave Kerslake an opportunity to learn the new songs. A week later, they traveled to Ridge Farm Studio to commence recording. The first track written for the album was Goodbye to Romance. Osborne stated that the song was his way of saying goodbye to his former band Black Sabbath, as he had thought his career was over after leaving the band. After performing a show in Birmingham, the band hastily returned to Ridge Farm to remix Goodbye to Romance for a single. The next morning, they were informed that their level label, Jet Records, instead wanted a brand new song to release as a single. Rhodes, Daisley, and Kerslake quickly put together the song You Said It All with drummer Kerslake performing the guide vocal at soundcheck while a drunken Osborne slept under the drum riser. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. The song was ultimately never recorded, although a live version release was released on Ozzy Osbourne Live EP in 1980. The final track was written No Bone Movies, which was originally intended to use only as a B-side, but was added to the album in order to give Kerslake a writing credit, as well as all the other material had been written before he joined the band. Keyboardist Don Airy claims that parts of Revelation, Mother Earth, as well as the intro to Mr. Crowley, were written by him in the studio, although he never received writing credit for these contributions. This is a very important record for metal music and the legendary status of Ozzy Osbourne, both as a personality in metal music and as a heavy metal frontman. So many great songs and great guitar work by Randy Rhodes, like I Don't Know, Crazy Train, Goodbye to, Remo to Romance, and the controversial song Suicide Solution. It was a breakthrough solo record and the continuation of the career of Ozzy post-Black Sabbath. Number five, Pantera, Vulgar Display of Power. Vulgar Display of Power is the sixth studio album by American heavy metal band Pantera, released on February 25th, 1992 through Adco Records. It was the band's second collaboration with producer Terry Date after having worked with him on their breakthrough album, Cowboys from Hell. The album was well received by both critics and fans, and as Pantera's highest selling album to date, and would eventually be certified double platinum. It is often considered one of the most influential heavy metal albums of the 1990s. In 2017, Rolling Stone ranked Vulgar Display of Power 10th on their list of 100 greatest metal albums of all time. Several tracks have become among the band's best known, such as Mouth for War, A New Level, Walk, Fucking Hostile, and This Love. The band's 1990 major label debut, Cowboys from Hell demonstrated a change in their musical direction from their 1980s material influenced by hard rock or glam metal bands like Van Halen and Kiss to a new similarity to bands like Slayer, Metallica, and Black Sabbath. You can't have a top metal albums list without mentioning this album by the legendary Pantera. I love this record and have a lot of wonderful memories tied to this record. It was definitely a change in direction for the band from Cowboys from Hell, which was still hanging on to some of those 80s era stylings, particularly the vocals reminded me a lot more of Judas Priest than modern Pantera. That started to disappear on this record, even more so on following albums. I cannot speak more highly enough for this legendary heavy metal record. It is a must listen to for Pantera fans for metal fans, especially metal fans that hail from my home state of Texas. Um, so once again, go check out that record. It's a damn good one. Number four, Slayer, Rain in Blood. Rain in Blood is the third studio album by American thrash metal band Slayer. Released on October 7th, 1986 by Def Jam Recordings. 
The album was the band's first collaboration with producer Rick Rubin, whose inept input helped the band's sound evolve. The release date of the album was delayed because of concerns regarding the lyrical subject matter of the opening track, Angel of Death, which refers to Josef Mengele and describes acts such as human experimentation that he committed at the Auschwitz concentration camp. The band's members stated they did not condone Nazism and were merely interested in the subject. Rain and Blood was well received by both critics and fans and was responsible for bringing Slayer to the attention of a mainstream metal audience. Today, it is often mentioned among the greatest heavy metal records ever. In 2017, listing the 100 greatest metal albums of all time, Rolling Stone magazine ranked Rain and Blood at number six. Alongside Anthrax's Among the Living, Megadeth's Peace Sells But Who's Buying, and Metallica's Master of Puppets, Rain in Blood helped define the sound. Alongside Anthrax's Among the Living, Megadeth's Peace Sells But Who's Buying, and Metallica's Master of Puppets, Rain in Blood helped define the sound of the emerging U.S. thrash metal scene in the mid-1980s and has remained influential ever since. The album was Slayer's first to enter the U.S. Billboard 200, peaking at number 94 and was certified gold on November 20th, 1992. In 2013, NME ranked it at number 287 on its list of 500 greatest metal al greatest albums of all time. This album was so damn important to me and my love for metal music. It's a short, but right to the point kind of record, very punk attitude meets thrash metal vibes. Their most important song they ever released, Raining Blood, that was the staple of their set list ever since. And it was also a great way to close the record. It was the first song by the band to catch my attention. If there was one record I had to consider by priority listening by Slayer, this would be it. Number three, Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast. The Number of the Beast is the third studio album by English heavy metal band, Iron Maiden. It was released on March 22nd, 1982 in the United Kingdom by EMI Records and in the United States by Harvest and Capital Records. The album was their first to feature vocalist Bruce Dickson, Dickinson with, and their last with drummer Clive Burr. Number of the Beast was met with critical and commercial success and became the band's first album to top the UK album's charts and reach the top 40 of the US Billboard 200. The album produced singles like Run to the Hills and Number of the Beast, the former of which became the band's first top 10 UK single. The album also was controversial, particularly in the United States, due to the religious references in its artwork and the title track's lyrics. Since the release of Number of the Beast, The Beast has become an alternative name for Iron Maiden and was later used in the titles of some of their compilations and live releases, including Best of the Beast and Visions of the Beast. This was a great, if not the greatest record by Iron Maiden. I got to see them live in 2017, and a lot of important songs off this record were played. Sadly, one song was noticeably absent from their set list, which was Hallowed Be Thy Name, due to a lawsuit involving the song at the time. I have reason to believe that the lawsuit was thrown out later on, but I'm not sure. Nonetheless, a must-listen for Iron Maiden fans. Number 2. Metallica, Master of Puppets Master of Puppets is the third studio album by the American heavy metal band Metallica, released on March 3, 1986 by Elektra Records. Recorded in Copenhagen, Denmark at Sweet Silence Studios with producer Fleming Rasmussen, it was the band's last album to feature Cliff Burton, their former bassist who died in a bus accident in Sweden during the album's promotional tour. The album's artwork designed by Metallica and Peter Mensch 
and painted by Don Bartigam, depicts a cemetery field of white crosses tethered to strings manipulated by a pair of hands clouded in a clouded blood-red sky with fiery orange glow on the horizon. Instead of releasing a single or a video in advance of the album's release, Metallica embarked on a five-month American tour in support of Ozzy Osbourne. The European leg was canceled after Burton's death in September 1986, and the band returned home to audition a new bassist. Master of Puppets peaked at number 29 on the Billboard 200 and received widespread acclaim from critics who praised its music and political lyrics. It's widely considered to be one of the greatest and most influential albums, uh, metal albums of all time and is credited with consolidating the American thrash metal scene. It was certified six times platinum by the RIAA in 2003 for shipping six million copies in the United States and was later certified six times platinum by Music Canada and platinum by the BPI. In 2015, Master of Puppets became the first metal album to be selected by the Library of Congress for preservation in the National Recording Registry for being, quote, culturally and historically or aesthetically significant. This it was another formative record in Metallica's career and their most critically praised record ever released. I don't think there's one bad track on this record. I can listen to it from start to finish over and over again. And I did that many times during my childhood and my teenage years in particular. I would recommend tracks like The Thing That Should Not Be, Sanitarium, Leper Messiah, and the instrumental Orion, and the closing track, Damage Incorporated. Number one, Black Sabbath, Paranoid. Paranoid is the second studio album by English heavy metal band Black Sabbath, released in September 1970 through Vertica Records in England and Warner Brothers Records in the U.S. The album contains several of the band's signature songs, including Iron Man, War Pigs, and the title track Paranoid, which is the band's only top 20 hit, reaching number four in the U.K. charts. In a 2017 publication by Rolling Stone, Magazine, Paranoid, was ranked number one on its list of 100 greatest metal albums of all time. The album is often cited as a key influence for the development of the heavy metal music genre, as well as one of the earliest heavy metal albums. Paranoid was the band's only album to top the UK albums chart until the release of 13 in 2013. This was by far in my opinion, the most important record, not only for Black Sabbath, but the whole of heavy metal music altogether. I cannot tell you how many times I've listened to this record and learned essential riffs on guitar from this particular record. Black Sabbath had its finest and heavy metal at its finest. An absolute must listen for any music fan overall. So these are my, are the top 13 heavy metal records according to music critics and loudwire.com. What do you think of this list? I thought for the most part, I'd agree with this list, but I'd probably switch out Megadeth's Rust in Peace over the Peace Sells record. But again, that's just me. What are your top 13 metal albums? Send me an email and tell me what you think. Speaking of which, I'm going to recommend Rust in Peace by Megadeth on this episode's album Shoutout. This was by far my favorite album by Megadeth, especially from what people consider the 90s golden age of Megadeth. It was a fantastic record, and I think I would pick this record over Peace Cells any day of the week. Better songs, better lyrics, better guitar playing, better concepts, period. The band was definitely firing all cylinders with the golden lineup in the 90s era Megadeth, featuring Marty Freeman on lead guitar, Dave Mustaine on lead guitar and vocals, David Ellefson on bass, and Nick Mens on drums. Highly recommend songs like the song Holy Wars, Punishment Do, Take No Prisoners, and my all-time favorite song by Megadeth, which arguably I think has one of the greatest guitar solos of all time, the song Tornado of Souls. So go ahead and give that one a listen, will you?
So that's going to wrap up today's episode. Before I go, I want to let people know that I am still looking for guests to be on the podcast. If you live in the San Antonio area and you're a heavy metal fan, please feel free to send me an email. That being said, that's going to finish things up for today's episode. I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another episode of Rock and Rob's Metal Madness Podcast. I am your host with the most, the Major Rager, the Metal Maniac, the Apache Norseman him- from hell himself, Rock and Rob. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, especially for our first time listeners. If you're tuning in via YouTube, please like this video, share it, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you want to support me directly, please send a digital tip through formats like Cash App, Chime, PayPal, or Venmo to Rock and Rob SA210. That's R O C K I N R O B S A210. You can also support me through Patreon. The link is in my YouTube channel description. Or you can go to Patreon and search an Apache Norseman from hell. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, or would just like to chat, feel free to send me an email to rockinroblives210. That's R-O-C-K-I-N-R-O-B-L-I-V-E-S-210 at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning in, my friends. Live long, live loud, and live legendary. Keep it evil, my metal people. (laughs) 